So we're going to be talking about publishing tonight, and we're thrilled to have James Colgrove, who I'm sure everyone knows is one of our core faculty members and is a professor in the School of Public Health. Also, Bella Fishbein, who's one of our alumni, who is now the managing editor of the American Journal of Bioethics. And we also have uh, the editors of the Voices in Bioethics, Sarah, and we have Myra. Myra. And we're also thrilled to have someone, uh, Liz, from the um, Writing Center, who's going to talk to us about the wonderful services that the Writing Center has for our students. So just to start us off, the reason we're having this session is because publishing is very important in bioethics, and it's important for all of you, because as bioethicists, we are involved in discussions that are front and uh, foremost in the media, in public decision making, in decision making that doctors do, that hospitals do, that lawyers do, that judges do, that politicians, policymakers do, et cetera, et cetera, at local levels, at national levels, at international levels. And all of us could be part of that discussion and can have an influence in the discussion, help patients help make things better. So it's important. Uh, and it's important partly to get your ideas out there. And we've been very successful in having our students write for the New York Times, the American Journal of Bioethics, elsewhere as well, uh, as well as Voices in Bioethics, which as many of you know is our student-run journal that's had 65,000 independent hits in its first year and really has made an impact as well. And uh, just as an overview, there are different kinds of writing and different types of venues for writing. So there um, is, uh, if you had to make a split, there's probably on the one hand popular press and the media. Uh, on the other hand, there's academia. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive by any means. Uh, and within the media, there are outlets like the New York Times, and people write op-eds, letters to the editor, et cetera, and also other journals, one of our alums, uh, Lisa Kearns has written op-eds with Art Kaplan for places like the Hartford Current. So there's, New York Times is hard, but there are other journals that are happy to have in thoughtful pieces. Uh, then there is the web, and there is uh, Voices in Bioethics, but there's also uh, the Hastings Center blog, for instance, um, uh, and other places like that. There's also academia, and all this is important uh, partly to help build your CVs in addition to making the world a better place and getting yourself known, et cetera. So within academia, there are different kinds of journals, uh, bioethics journals. There are uh, journals like the New England Journal of Medicine that everyone sees, whether they're in, in medicine, whether they're in uh, a heart doctor, a cancer doctor, or an ethicist. Uh, there are journals within a specific area. So if you're writing about the ethics of cancer, there are cancer journals that are more specific and targeted. So the New England Journal may take 1% of articles. The cancer ones may take 10% or depending. There are many, many cancer journals. There are bioethics-specific journals, and they vary a little bit. And, um, uh, and within that, sometimes there are op-eds or opinion pieces. So they'll you know, write 3,000 words. I think that um, uh, we should ban people from going to the Olympics for Z because of Zika virus, or I think that you know, we should close all the beaches in Florida because of Zika virus, or I think we should keep all the beaches open in Florida because of Zika virus. So uh, two topics. Uh, there's also the American Journal of Bioethics has each week, uh, each month rather, um, uh, target articles, and they invite people to write a short commentary. And a lot of our students have been very successful with those. It's sort of a short. Um, not more than a thousand words, sort of a three, four page response, a sort of reason response to a controversial piece, and that's a good way to get in an academic literature. Uh, and I often joke that it's easy to get published, you just have to say something no one else has said. Um, one, uh, which was actually sort of hard, but uh, so one, if you pick a new area, fewer people have said something. If you're going to write about why I think abortion is, uh, is good, uh, and we should have a law supporting abortion. That's great that I think that way. But there have been a lot of people who've written that over the years. And it's going to be hard to say something that no one else has said there. On the other hand, if you say Zika, not much is thought about Zika, right? Or Ebola or whatever. And it doesn't mean don't um, write about other things as well. But there's enough new stuff that, you know, uh, uh, that's, that's important. Um, so, uh, um, maybe actually we'll start with the person from the writing center because so I, uh, two, two things I want to say one other thing which is a, a, a one common problem is that when you're writing a student paper 
a lot of what students are understandably trying to do is show, look, I've done my literature search. Like, I've, this, is, this, this person says this, and that person says that. When you write for another audience, they assume you've done the literature. So they assume you're an expert. And even if you're not, you can fake it. <laughs> you, you, you could know the literature and still know the literature and understand it and still have a unique, important contribution. And so it's not important to say, to cite every single reference. It's important to pick out what's important and to say, often argue against something or someone or what's been said. Anyway, so the Writing Center is a great opportunity. Uh, it helps students in uh, both classes and also for other things. So um, we're thrilled to have Liz with us. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna, I have a couple handouts which I'll send around the room as I'm talking. I just wanna take a few minutes to introduce the Columbia Writing Center, who we are, what we do, and how you can incorporate us into your writing process. And um, the most basic way you can engage with the Writing Center is you can schedule a consultation with us. And what's that? It's a one-on-one, -on -one, 45 minute appointment with one of our consultants and we're graduate students and post-grads with extensive writing and teaching experience. And just kind of our values, and it's, fast, interestingly enough, it's in your packet here. Number six says, write with others. And that's kind of our, one of our kind of core values at the Writing Center is that writing isn't something that happens in isolation, but something that you can seek feedback with and have it be part of your process. Um, and advanced writers do this. So ways to get a lot of it out of the writing center is come early and come often and use us throughout. Um, you can have, bring drafts, early, early drafts, like final drafts, and so on. And then a few other things to note, it's free, so don't hesitate. Mm -hmm. um, and if you take a look at your handout, a lot of kind of um, major things are noted. We're in philosophy 310. So down on the main campus, down the street. And we also have a satellite location in Butler. And the, the link here is how you can sign up for an account and schedule an appointment with us. Um, if you find that we're really slammed, which occasionally happens, there are also drop-in hours, which you can come to Philosophy um, 310 and kind of schedule an appointment. And um, you can bring us any project in any stage um, and so on. And some common questions are on the back in case all of this doesn't hit right now. And also on this small sheet, we have a, um, a set of workshops that we run throughout the semester on different topics um, by our different consultants. Um, are there any questions? So I have two questions. So one is, um, what are the kinds of um, problems or issues you see that students come with that you find you can help the most with or common problems or when should a student think, you know, maybe I should come to the writing center? Yeah. Um, where I use the writing center in my own work and also what I get most excited about to talk with people about is kind of the conceptual, like building the logic, the, the train of logic through the argument and so on. And I think that's always a great time to get feedback because um, one of the kind of the main tenet of how we work is we can respond as readers to your writing and dramatize the presence of a reader. And especially it sounds like with the kind of writing you guys are interested in doing, that's a really important to be thinking about your reader, kind of get out of your head and get some feedback. So I definitely always like to seek feedback on my own writing at that stage of I'm crafting the argument and like, are all the pieces there? How is this coming across? So if I call up, I mean, so, um, usually people are able to make an appointment, it's, or if not the drop-in hours, you're able to accommodate everyone. Um, I mean, we're a popular service, so, but I think generally, um, if you go on our website, you'll see we have a rolling kind of open schedule of a whole a week, so seven days. So right now you could book an appointment for uh, next Wednesday. Um, and if you look a week out, um, there's almost always spaces open. Um, if you want one the same day, then maybe you might need to use the drop-in hours. But if you're thinking a little bit ahead in your project, sometimes I like to schedule my own appointments with my colleagues a, a week in advance as a deadline to work towards. <laughs> yes? Something that this, my students sometimes ask me is um, the limits of the services that you're able to provide and sure. can you, like, will you read an entire draft? Will you, I, I assume you look at the assignment guidelines.
Yeah, I, and the kind of way we approach that is we kind of ask you as writers to have that in mind when you come in, like what you want to focus on. And so certainly I think referring to the assignment and thinking about that is a really great place to work from. And um, Part of your question. Are, are there, will, will you, for example, read an entire lengthy draft of a paper? Yeah, I think how I often, if I get someone comes in and you're like, I wrote this 20, 50 page thing, is I'll kind of say, all right, what feels most exigent? Is it a structural issue? Should we kind of skim through it quickly or kind of establish something? What can we do realistically in 45 minutes that'll be the most helpful to you? And so maybe it's, we can look at the abstract and actually assess a lot from there. Or maybe we really just want to quickly skim through and just be like, okay, what does each paragraph accomplish? Let's take a bigger picture view of that. Other questions? In, in my online course, I just have some very brief assignments so far. One was very structured. It said, you know, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Compare, contrast, whatever. And half the students just meander on without even paying any attention to it. The other one was rather uh, open, gave them a lot of opportunity to just pick on something that grabbed their attention. So do you find people sometimes coming to you saying, I don't really know how to fulfill this assignment, uh, there's a lot of words here, but I'm not really sure how to make sense of what the instructions are? Yeah, we definitely do. Um, we, I've cer certainly people can come in, even with just a prompt or an outline or some ideas, and be like, actually, what is this saying? And so we can look together and say, all right, what kind of try and construct what we think the assignment is and like yeah so that's certainly something we can do yeah you're developing a model yeah for approaching how you think about a prompt or kind of analyze something yes i was going to ask a question in terms of it sounds like your the center provides almost like editing support for students with specific um, papers that they're working on do, do you have any comments on things that you've seen, like general themes on what students can do better or how they, how they can approach a writing project better or a research paper better that you've seen you know, in your time as a consultant sure. at the center? So, what you know, general tips on how to, how to approach a project? Yeah, I think one is really seeking feedback throughout your process and like making it a social process and getting thinking about your reader and finding readers for your work. And I think that's one of the places the Writing Center can come in. Um, and, and so I think that can be really helpful, that sort of like that assessing at points and starting early, <laughs> I think can be really helpful. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be staying for the rest okay, of the good, time. Right. So, good. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. So, I encourage students to use the service. It's really helpful, and they're there for you. And go for it. Okay. So, uh, I thought we'd next turn to James and Arthur and Bella to talk about their perspectives on suggestions or insights and how to help our students publish or related thoughts so um, so uh, Bob actually s said almost everything that I was going to say <laughs> so uh, when he says that you should think of something that no one else has ever said you should take that advice seriously um, I have uh, actually first of all I'll put in a plug for the writing center I think they are a great resource and I have referred many students to them over the years and I've always heard really good feedback uh, from students who have had a, a good experience there so um, you should you should use that resource. So I have a, a few pieces of advice advice that are both uh, procedural and substantive related to publishing and bioethics. One is that um, <coughs> part of your professional development in bioethics should really to uh, uh, be to become very familiar with the journals in the field and the landscape of of scholarly publication. So you should be able to immediately, uh, like right now, tick off in your head 
a dozen journals where you might consider publishing an article. And if you can't, you should develop that kind of mental schema so that you really have a sense of what is the universe of possible places that you could submit a journal, a, an article, and what um, journals are appropriate for what you've, um, what you've written. So uh, concretely what that means is that you know what kind of papers different journals publish. Do they publish uh, empirical pieces or theoretical pieces or both? Um, what length of papers do they typically publish? What topics do they typically cover or do they not typically cover? Um, do they run commentaries or editorials? And um, so, you know, there, there are a few ways to do that. One way is that whenever you read an article that you like, make a note of the journal that it appeared in and then take some time to go to the website of that journal and spend some time browsing the last <clears throat> five years of their table of contents and read through the articles that they've published. This is much easier to do than it used to be because everything's online now and you can do it in the comfort and privacy of your pajamas. You don't have to even go to a library. Um, you can just sit here and look through years, years and years of back issues of the Hastings Center report. Um, when you do that, so that will give you a sense of, of the kinds of papers that they publish and the length and the general analytic approach that, that, that they take. When you do that, you should also, on their website, go to the instructions for authors. This is very key. Every journal uh, website has an instructions for authors page that lays out usually in, in pretty much detail the um, uh, maximum length, the procedures for submitting it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, you can, something else to find out if you're interested is the impact factor of the journal. So you all know that um, there are a couple of standard metrics uh, of journals called impact factors. This is a, a measure of how widely cited uh, articles in that journal uh, are, and you can usually find that out just by Googling. Web of Science is the is the major one. Is there is there another one that's I think that's the one that's typically used. Um, you know, this is this is more of an issue for you if you are pursuing an academic career, um, but uh, just to, as as part of developing a sense of of what. Um, what the top journals are and what journals are possibilities for you is to have a sense of, of what are the, the high impact journals in the field. Um, another piece of advice is that some journals you can actually email the editor and to inquire if the journal might be interested in running an article. Um, and if the answer, if the editor responds, I mean, usually my experience has been that editors will, will be pretty frank with you. And so if they respond, you know, frankly, this isn't something that we would be interested in publishing, then you can save yourself uh, a lot of time uh, and effort of going through the submission process. Um, another piece of advice is to think as broadly as possible about where you might public publish an article that has a bioethical focus and not limit yourself just to, um, strictly speaking, uh, journals of bioethics, because that's a pretty small universe. There are really only a handful of bioethics journals. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of journals of uh, health and biomedical sciences and public health that publish articles related to ethical issues in medicine and science and health. So think uh, about reaching with, uh, with your writing different disciplines and different audiences. Uh, I often uh, read student papers where I think, you know, this, this paper would be really interesting to an audience of epidemiologists or some other professional audience that you might not have thought about, about reaching. Um, one of the leading journals in my field, which is public health, the American Journal of Public Health, is not uh, by any means a bioethics journal, but they will routinely publish commentaries that have uh, a kind of um, ethical focus. They have a standing column called Health Law and Ethics, and it runs articles with a strong ethical focus, um, things like uh, the ethics of compulsory HPV immunization, allocation of scarce life-saving resources in a flu pandemic. So if you were only thinking what are the bioethics journals, you might miss a very good uh, venue for your publication like that. And there are many other examples of, of uh, journals of health and science and medicine that will accept papers that have a kind of ethical um, an ethical flavor. You might need to uh, edit and tailor your piece to, to uh, sort of speak the language of that, uh, of that discipline, and you might, in fact, want to 
um, even downplay some of the ethical language that you might use if you were addressing just an audience of bioethicists. So if you submit something to AJPH, uh, keep the references to deontology to a minimum um, because they don't, that's not the kind of thing that their readers are, are used to seeing. So you might want to um, make minor tweaks to the language that you use. Um, Let's see, Bob talked about non-academic audiences, um, and I think that's really key. Um, you know, I think, uh, and even social media now, um, I don't know how many of you tweet, but you know, tweets can make a big, um, uh, a big impact. Uh, there's all kinds of, of um, uh, blogs and online um, journals, uh, slate.com, Huffington Post, I don't know what some of the other ones are, but it's it's far, far easier to publish there. And actually, um, in many cases, you'll reach a much, much wider audience through that than you would uh, in an academic journal. So it really depends on um, on who you want to reach. And you should always be able to answer the question, who, who am I speaking to? What kind of audience do I want to reach? Am I trying to advance theory by reaching an audience of academics? Am I trying to change policy and practice? If it's the latter, you may not want to be publishing in a, a scholarly peer-reviewed journal. You might want to um, publish in some place that, that policymakers actually read, which is typically not <laughs> peer-reviewed academic journals. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say is that you should always be able to answer the question about anything that you've written, um, what is new and significant about it? Um, and this sort of picks up on the, the comment that, that Bob made about lit reviews. So um, most uh, peer-reviewed scholarly journals do not publish lit reviews. They want to publish something that's new. Um, the editor is going to not simply want to rehash what's already been said. Um, so you need to be prepared to say what is what is really new and significant about this article. So in the first page or so, if not the first paragraph, um, you should be able to answer the question, you know, this article makes the following contribution, dot, dot, dot. This paper increases our understanding of this issue. This paper addresses an urgent policy area. This paper helps to improve policy or, pra policy or practice by... Um, oh, and just on this issue of, of novel topics, um, keep an eye out for stuff in the news. And if you have an idea for a commentary, um, Art Kaplan is a genius on this. I think he like he gets up at midnight and reads what's going to be in the paper, and then he like immediately writes 250 words on it. And so often you'll see in like the New York Times or or the Hartford Current or wherever, somebody is really quick to write an ethical commentary on a new issue. So keep your eyes out for what you think is gonna be a hot issue and don't wait. Like if you see a breaking news story and it, an, an ethical angle occurs to you, write it up and send it in because if you can be first, that's an opening for you. Um, and again, you wanna be, uh, you wanna say something that's novel. So I guess that's it. I'm happy to answer questions, I guess, in the Q&A. I should just say also, in the handbook we distributed, we had a list of the major bioethics journals there. Uh, and that's yeah. there too, okay. So Arthur Kuflick is next. Arthur is our wonderful uh, professor of philosophy. Thank you, Bob. And uh, I don't know if I need a guide to publishing. I need a guide to the campus map yeah. <laughs> uh, to find my way here. And that's why I'm uh, at a disadvantage of not knowing the points that Bob uh, oh. already uh, brought up. Did you use a slide? We did have a slide one time where we showed all the journals listed uh, on the screen, but I guess we're now having it in your own take home with you uh, printed uh, uh, handout. Um, James did a, just a wonderful job just now. I can't really add anything to what he said, but being a philosopher, uh, I'll try. Um, he, uh, there, there is a slight bit of tension between the sort of thing Bob likes to say, you know, get something new and different and people pay attention, and James's idea, look in the journals and see what topics they've been publishing on. But of course, there really isn't a blatant contradiction there. There's just a little tension, uh, because you may have something really new to say about a topic that you've seen in, you know, all these people are saying this, that, and the other, but they've all left out, or they've overlooked, or they've not paid attention to. It's possible to be new and different on a topic that is a, a, a recurring theme for that particular journal. But I do think sometimes a journal has to wake up and, uh, you know, 
this is an important thing and we've never published anything on this. So, so it all reconciles, it all comes together, I think. Um, the bioethics journals that I could say off the top of my head, and I'm gonna probably need some help from those who are looking at the pamphlet, I mean, there, there is a little bit more than, than you might suspect just with bioethics in the title, as it were, right? I mean, there's the journal called Bioethics. Uh, there's the Journal of Medical Ethics, JME, right? There's the um, Hastings Center Report, but that doesn't have bioethics in the title, but we all know what the Hastings Center is a center of. Uh, and four, um, there's um, uh, the Cambridge Quarterly of Healthcare um, ethics, right? That's got health and ethics in the title. Uh, there, there, there's more than you might think there's, but broadening out into philosophy, but with an ethics orientation, and some of these philosophy journals could use more uh, pieces that were not just ethics, but healthcare ethics, uh, medical ethics, bioethics. Some of them could stand to have more of that submitted to them, really, but okay, so we have the classic journal ethics. It's been around a very long time. We have uh, more recently, like from early 1970s, philosophy and public affairs used to come, come, obviously both philosophical and public policy oriented at the same time. Uh, used to come out of Princeton. I think uh, Hopkins has taken over the uh, pr production of that. Um, very eminent journals in philosophy, but looking for you, what people sometimes call applied ethics. Ethics is applied, you might say. But um, uh, there's also, um, lesser well-known ones, but good ones, like uh, Social Ethics and Public Policy, um, Journal of Applied Ethics, uh, it, that's a title. Um, the, um, let's see, back to um, medicine, is the Journal of Medicine and Philosophy, or I guess, no, I think it's the reverse, Journal of Philosophy and Medicine. Journal of Philosophy and Medicine has some, inter can publish interesting pieces that are both really engaging medicine and bioethics more generally, but are looking for something philosophical in tone. Um, there's this one here that I just remember, the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. Now this actually speaks to something James, or uh, amplifies something James was also saying, that there are journals in special fields, in his case public health, but other fields like law, um, like genetics, like pediatrics, where they will have a piece uh, of now and again, if you especially you study what, how the journal is formatted, uh, of an, an ethical nature. And just as we have some, uh, there's general philosophy journals like uh, the Journal of Philosophy, which is produced out of Columbia and is the oldest philosophy journal in the world. And they have published a few key pieces in bioethics, the most famous anti-abortion essay uh, in philosophical circles by a man named Marquis, published in the Journal of Philosophy. Um, it's a little harder to get into that journal but they will do a very philosophical piece that relates to uh, bioethics. And similarly, on the science side, uh, some pieces I've used in the journal Science, um, something by uh, Zeke Emanuel and my late colleague Al Wertheimer, which we use in the philosophy course, a uh, short essay on the ethics of allocation in, under, uh, in pandemics uh, and the like in science. Uh, so, you know, keep, keep an eye on that, especially if you've latched on to, as they were saying, a new, you know, if you could be a, a, a you could, you could uh, scoop Art Kaplan, if, <laughs> of course, he'll be first, but he may not be best. But you could, <laughs> you, you, you could, um, you could actually um, think about something where it has an empirical scientific aspect to it, but it has a really important ethical aspect, and see whether one of these journals that's devoted to science, what's another one, the Lancet, right? Both Science, Nature, and Lancet are distinguished science journals, but they will have a slot every once in a while for a significant ethical issue that's uh, arising from those. So I, don't, I think uh, James's advice was really very, very uh, on the mark, very practical. I didn't hear you say, James, what I've heard you say in the past, uh, something about the elevator test. I think you were gesturing at that toward the end when he was asking you to think about how would you say what your thing is about? How, how would you put it right at the beginning? In this paper, I, uh, you know, do this and that, or I take up this. Um, I think you used to call it the elevator test. So this, the, uh, you all know the elevator screen? Are you, you're familiar with this idea? Oh, sorry. Yes. 
So this is the idea that you are going about your day and you step into an elevator and you suddenly realize that you're standing next to a very important person who is in a position to fulfill your every wish. You have a, a grant you want to get funded and you're standing next to the president of the Ford Foundation or you have an article you want to get published and you're standing next to the American Journal of Bioethics. You have the length of an elevator ride, which is what, a minute and 15 seconds, to completely bowl them over and convince them to um, uh, to publish your article. So this is actually an exercise that I do in, in our master's thesis class, which is I try to get students to write their elevator speech. And it's a useful way, I think, to, to crystallize your ideas. This important person, really intelligent person, and what could you tell them that would uh, catch their attention? I, I consider that, James was saying maybe, how would your opening paragraph be? Also your abstract, because the abstract can be quite important. There are people who are gonna be scanning you know, the databases and they're just going to be reading abstracts. So to draw in a wider audience um, and have an impact, it's good to have a good abstract. But you know, now we're veering over not only how to get published, but how to write. Uh, you know, I don't want to take over other people's bailiwick, but I believe in you know, dual strategies. Like you know, sometimes you just want to write, but you don't know where to begin or where to end, and thoughts are nagging at you, and you just scribble a bunch of thoughts down. But other times you want and you see whether you can then put them in some order, what am I getting at here? I should start with this and finish with that. In other words, if you really need to write, but you don't have a clear structure or outline, you know, maybe at least get some thoughts out and you'll feel I've got something that I was thinking about and I'm gonna revisit it. But the other track is this elevator, what's my abstract gonna look like track? Um, because that of course can reinform what you're doing in the writing. When I think about what am I, what, what's the, what's the uh, nugget here? <laughs> or the nuggets that I'm going to um, uh, deliver, um, that may help you take those rambling thoughts that you were scribbling down madly um, and say, aha, I see, how, I, I see how they, why I was thinking all these thoughts. It's really about this or about that. That's sort of striking a balance between the bigger picture and getting some of the details worked out. But um, yeah, there are more bioethics journals than you might think, um, but then there are these other journals too, both in pure science, pure philosophy, and in uh, specialized fields where they have to have some room uh, for an occasional ethics piece. So that's all I have to say. I'm, you guys say it a lot. Well, that was great. Thank you. So next, uh, Bella. We're thrilled to have uh, Bella Fishbein joining us. As I mentioned, she's uh, one of our alums who's the ed managing editor of the American Journal of Bioethics. So any thoughts, suggestions, comments are most welcome. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so all great advice from Arthur and James and Bob. Um, I'll underline some of it. Um, but first, I'll just say I remember sitting where you guys are sitting not too long ago and just the mysterious, confusing world of publishing. And it's really hard to start off and it's really hard to know what to do. So I've been where you're at and there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I think the most important piece of advice I can give you that a lot of people have already said is just to read. Um, read journals. Hopefully you got into bioethics because you're actually interested in bioethics. So hopefully you enjoy reading about bioethics. Um, so read journals and see what the writing is like, see what the content is like, um, and that will familiarize you with the journals, with what topics they're publishing on, and that sort of thing. Um, and don't be afraid of editors. We love talking with authors, um, even just emails asking, hey, will this be a good fit for the journal? Um, those are great. I respond to all of them. And I think most editors are actually very similar on that regard. Um, so I want to focus a little bit less on the advice aspect of this and a little bit more just on the review process. So I work at the American Journal of Bioethics, um, and before I worked here, I had no idea what happens to an article after you hit submit. Um, so I just want to shed some light on what happens to articles as they go through the process, and then I'll follow up with just a few common problems that I see with a lot of our authors and just a few suggestions. And feel free to stop me at any point with questions. Okay, so the American Journal of Bioethics, um, we've been around for 15 years and we publish on philosophy, ethics, public health, clinical ethics, research ethics, everything basically. 
specifically having to do with bioethics. Um, and we have two sister journals, the American Journal of Bioethics with Empirical Bioethics and Neuroethics also. And we have four different publication types. Target articles, those are the main articles. Um, they're the longer articles that we post for commentary, and everyone is invited to comment on these articles. These are the target article calls that you guys see emailed around from Lillian every now and then. So OPCs, that is the second manuscript type that we have, open peer commentaries, basically. And that is the whole platform of a job. It's that bioethics is a conversation. It's not just a piece that's published and that's that. It's, um, you know, there are different, there are different viewpoints. There are different elements that articles don't always cover. So we like to open up all of our pieces um, to the wider audience for commentary. Um, we also have clinical ethics cases, research ethics cases, and commentaries, and also book reviews. Um, so I mentioned that we post all of our articles up for commentary, and that's the sort of thing that you find out by reading a journal. Like, for example, a significant part of our decision process of whether or not we'll accept an article is, do we think this will elicit good commentaries? Um, so if you write a piece that's just not very controversial or maybe doesn't have much else to talk about, um, a job may not be the journal for you. And that's the sort of thing that you learn just reading the journal. Um, and you wouldn't know otherwise. So target articles, like I mentioned, um, usually you're looking for a gap in the literature. You want to say something new, like Bob has said. Um, our review process for these articles is, so first papers get an initial review, the first eyes on the paper, and usually those will only get rejected if it's obvious, poor quality, if it's off topic, if it doesn't fit into our journal, um, if it's too long, so following instructions and guidelines is really important, um, the content, the style just doesn't match or if it's poorly referenced. So if it's clear that the author is not familiar with the literature. Um, after that initial review, let's say the article passes, it is assigned to an associate editor who then also reviews it and then decides whether to send that piece out for peer review or to reject it. So if a piece gets sent out for peer review, it's sent out to individuals who are recognized as authorities in the field. So for example, if you're writing about, let's say brain death, um, we would probably try to send it out to James Burnett or someone like that, um, some sort of expert in the field to review and comment on your piece. And those reviewers evaluate your article based on topic, originality, quality, validity, and that sort of thing. And also for a job, they evaluate it on whether or not they think it will elicit commentaries. And they also, of course, look at your lit review and citations. Um, so just one word on peer reviewers. They are unpaid. They are doing this work for free. And even if reviewers are critical, their reviews are godsend. Um, they are like angels who are trying to better your paper for free. So please take their advice to heart and don't be offended by any criticism that you receive in a review. Okay, so we've got our peer reviewers in, then the editorial team looks at all of the comments from the reviewers, and we also add our own comments. So a lot of times, um, we'll send it out to maybe two or three or four reviewers and there's not always agreement. So we sit down as a team and look over the comments and add our own and might say, well, we agree with reviewer one or we don't think you should worry about reviewer three, um, that sort of thing. We add our comments, we add our recommendations and then we submit a decision. Um, there is hardly any paper that I can remember that gets accepted right off the bat. Most papers, most papers are even revise and resubmit the first version of it. So if you ever get a revise and resubmit, don't be disheartened. Take those reviews and resubmit them. There are so many manuscripts, so many authors who get a revise and resubmit and were interested in their work, but they don't end up submitting a second draft, which they basically just missed a potential publication. 
Um, so then we get revisions in and we do the same thing again, um, same process all over for target articles. The review process for our open peer commentaries is a bit different since our turnaround time is really quick. It's about a month. Um, those are just reviewed as a set by the editorial team. So if you've submitted a commentary and if you've been rejected, um, if your commentary has been rejected, keep in mind that they're reviewed as a set. So maybe someone said something that you already said. Um, and I encourage you to sign up for our list and keep submitting proposals um, because you never know. Okay, so that hopefully sheds a little bit of light on the review process. Happy to answer some questions. Um, and let me just go over some common problems that I've seen. Um, okay, so this has been said so many times, but the number one problem that I see is that the article is not suitable for the journal. So again, read the journal, get to know the audience, get to know what they're looking for. And if you don't know, ask the editors. Um, the second most common problem is not engaging with the literature. So you can have a referenced piece, but not a well-referenced piece. So again, with the example of brain death, if you're not citing James Burnett, you are missing a huge part of the literature. And the third most common problem is lack of content. So answering those questions like, where does your research sit within the wider within the wider scholarly landscape. Not just saying something new, but why? Which gap does whatever you're saying fill in? Um, and this comes out a lot of times in peer review, a lot of rejections because of lack of content or clarity. Um, as far as beginners go, the two most common problems I see is turning a thesis, like your master's thesis, into a paper, which I have done, guilty. Um, and generally, it just hits too many objectives. It's unfocused. If your thesis is really good, maybe you can turn it into two or three papers, but it takes a lot of work. You can't just submit your thesis as is most of the time. And the second um, best piece of advice I think I can give to beginners is ideally you should be working with an experienced author and a mentor as a co-author or a senior author just so you can be familiar with that process with how it all works get their advice on writing submitting resubmitting and revisions and your citations and make sure that your um, lit page is really well referenced um, I think that's all I've got for you guys. If you didn't hand out the um, Publishing Without Perishing, the ASBH Guide to Publishing, that's a really great reference. Um, and I highly suggest looking it over for more advice. Well, that's incredibly helpful. Uh, any questions for Bella at the moment? Yes, James. Oh, yes, pass the mic. Make sure you speak in the mic. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I guess on that last note a little bit, uh, how much do uh, academic accolades factor into deciding who gets published and who doesn't? Uh, if Dr. Kuflik and I submit the same article on the same topic, relatively similar quality, but he's a PhD and a professor emeritus at a university and I'm, uh, you know, I just finished <laughs> undergrad a few months ago, uh, how often do you give the preference to the person with the terminal degree or with the uh, position? Am sure. I, am I, uh, the creek, so to speak, or you know, is there hope yet for me? <laughs> it's a really good question, and it's a tough one. Um, there's always kind of a give and take within our editorial team, especially with reviewing the um, commentaries, because we will get a bunch of big names, but then we'll also get a bunch of student submissions, um, and really, we try to take what is best. Um, our peer reviews are all blind, so they won't know who the author is. But obviously, our editorial team knows who the author is. Um, I think for target articles, it's it can be important to work with a senior author or a co-author for some journals just to have that guidance, not so much for the name recognition, but just to polish your piece. Um, but I don't think that not having a big shot name necessarily at all prohibits you from getting published or being considered at all.
the last reference that you mentioned, Lillian will send it around? Okay. Other questions for Bell at the moment? Okay, what we're gonna do now is hear from the Voices in Bioethics editors. So uh, why don't you, do, uh, uh, why don't you sit up here? Bella was the first student we admitted to see. <laughs> there you go. Bella, would you say, by the way, that your journal is more interested in uh, target pieces that the Center of Health or that other journal is looking for a very quality piece, even if it puts to rest a subject and won't be too controversial? I think that's characteristic of a job, but not necessarily of all other things. Oh, do you think, just a quick one before our friends from Voices in Bioethics, do you think that a job, <clears throat> you did it, explain it very well, that you're looking for target pieces that will elicit a lot of discussion and, or if you will, controversy, but do you think um, there are other journals that are maybe willing to publish a piece that is almost definitive and probably couldn't engender so much controversy. It'll just be there as a very good piece that very few people would want to challenge because it's done so well. I mean, um, <laughs> it, it, there is uh, you know a difference between getting something that's controversial and getting something that's necessarily maybe the best piece on that subject. Yeah, of course. There are. I think most journals aren't really looking for commentary. I think that's a unique thing within a job, but. Right. Um, you guys listed some of them, Lancet, BMJ, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Science, Nature, those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, they're looking for one-off sorts of pieces. Great. Here you Thanks, Bela. Of course. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah. Um, and I'm Myra. And we're the editors of Voices and Bioethics. Um, so can everyone see the website? Um, so basically I'll talk about the structure of the journal and then um, how submissions work and the process of editing and then take your questions. Um, so we have a few different sections of the journal and the journal's been running for about three years and Myra's been here since the inception. Um, so we have the Newswire blog which um, is basically um, a weekly publication of uh, a thousand words maximum and it's really just a three to four page um, kind of blurt of an idea something that um, you want to talk about um, to cover the news cycle so um, say you look in the New York Times and see a, a publication on um, Yelp um, so Yelp reviews and healthcare and the impact of that and so if you want to talk about that and, and strike a commentary or say your own opinion and kind of jump off of that, that would be a great uh, Newswire blog post and then submit it to us and then we'll send it to a peer reviewer um, and get you published pretty quickly within a one to two week um, publication cycle. So that's Newswire. It's a great way to do a small rant or a blurb about the news. Um, if you could scroll up to features. Um, so features, so um, in your coursework, if you um, write a paper that you really love, say on medical tourism or abortion access in Texas or whatever it may be, um, and that's a longer piece, say um, 15 to 3,000 words, um, that would be a great uh, piece for features. It's a, a longer analysis, but we really wanna hear your voice. Um, and to hone in on kind of a concise analysis of your topic and, and a, more of an original contribution and less of a lit search, lit review. Um, the op-ed section is similar to features but shorter in length, so emphasis on concision. Um, and let's see. Careers in Bioethics is a really exciting um, one of our sections, and uh, Carolyn Chapman has done a great interview with Dan Callahan, the, one of the co-founders of the Hastings Center, so I'd highly recommend checking that out. Um, and 
so we're running a series of interviews with um, significant bioethics bioethicists in the field, like Ruth Macklin, and we're working on publishing those interviews, those transcripts. Um, Tom Beecham as well, um, Childress, um, a few others. And so if you're interested in interviewing a bioethicist in the field, um, we'd ask that you join our staff and write for a semester and then potentially in the spring semester, we could talk about um, interviewing someone you'd wanna talk to. The next section is clinical narratives and if you're a current med student or nursing student or know someone in the clinic whose perspective you'd really like to tap into, we'd love for you to talk to them and sit down and write some notes and kind of write based off of that interview or write something as a synthesis. synthesis. Um, let's see. Art, media, and bioethics is great to really tap into um, the media or um, literature on different bioethics topics. Um, the, is anyone familiar with the movie Contagion? Um, so that's uh, kind of graphic but interesting movie to, to talk about and, and a, a great example of uh, bioethics in media. And so that's the focus of our, our content there. Um, so that's basically it so we every year we have an essay contest as well and that's for undergraduates and this summer we had an essay contest and that was a great hit because um, we had three different categories reproductive ethics clinical ethics and global uh, challenges and ethics and we received 50 submissions from all over the country as well as the world from Mexico Lithuania and India and it was a really wonderful way to get the word out there of the bioethics program, our journal, and really see the high quality of submissions that we received as well. Um, so we welcome submissions. Um, we welcome from students, from faculty, from um, people working as clinicians, and, and we welcome your questions. Myra, do you have anything to add? I don't think so. Um. I guess, yeah, in terms of our current students, we're taking applications right now for editorial staff and staff writers and um, a couple other aspects of the journal. So um, feel free to ask us questions now or after if you have any questions about that, because we would love to get our fall semester up and running again. I just want to say that it's a great opportunity. Students have really gotten engaged and learned a lot about writing, partly by editing, and partly it's a great experience to sort of run a website and learn a lot of skills about managing and uh, running a, a news organization, as it were. Uh, and I think people have really enjoyed working with it. So I encourage, our, especially our incoming class, to really get involved and check it out and uh, both write, but also be part of the editing team. And we, we do have people from all over the world involved, and this is being videotaped, so people may watch it. And so whoever's out there watching, <laughs> you too can be an editor. You don't have to be here to be an editor and certainly not to be a writer. Uh, OK, questions, comments? Yes. I was just wondering, um, you know, given that students have papers to write for many of the different classes that they're taking, uh, to make it most easily transferable for a submission into voices, what do you recommend in terms of reference style and, uh, um, you know, gen just generally, how can they write their paper for the class so that it's the most, the easiest for them to just turn around and submit it to voices? Because I know you guys use a certain reference style and EndNote, and so I was wondering if you could speak to that. So we follow the Chicago Manual style. Um, we use EndNotes and for references, and um, that's pretty consistent throughout the journal. Um, if you're taking a paper from a class and hoping to submit it, um, that's perfectly fine. We welcome that. And um, if you feel like, oh, well, I want to hone my, my own voice in, in the argument, 
uh, we welcome you to do that before submitting or we're happy to work with you through the review process. The floor is now open, either questions for voices or for Arthur or James or myself or Bella or the Writing Center. Um, Myra, I'm very, I'm, Myra, I'm very impressed that you, you were with this journal since its inception. You were a freshman or a sophomore? Yeah, a sophomore. You were a sophomore? Yeah. And uh, you must have worked with Brandon Sultan yeah. and Matt Diaz mm -hmm. and so forth. And didn't Matt start as while he was still at the University of Chicago? So. Yeah. Bob's point about how you could even be on the editorial staff from, yeah. from afar. But my question to you is, to what extent have you been able to uh, bring uh, into the picture uh, Columbia School of Journalism students? Because obviously the School of Journalism is a famous journalism school. Mm -hmm. have, have journalism students come to you, or can you folks make an outreach uh, to them? Uh, because this seems like the kind of enterprise that would uh, be interesting to those of them who were in, I had two journalism students in the reproductive ethics course in the spring, so I do know that some journalism students are really interested in bioethics. Not all of them, I, I suspect, but many of them. So uh, have you had some uh, cooperation with them, or maybe it's something to do? Yeah, I don't think we've had formal cooperation with them, but we've definitely, we're constantly brainstorming who to reach out to and um, how to get our word out there more, so that would be a good idea for this year. Like, I can reach out to people there, too. We know. Yeah, that would be good. Be Questions, comments? All right, well, if not, going once, going twice. <laughs> okay, well, um, I thought it was great. Thank you so much uh, to everyone who's been involved. Bella, James, Arthur, Myra, Sarah, Liz, thank you. Uh, we'll be around if you want to talk with us informally. Uh, please feel free to reach out to any of us, I think, at any point in the year, and uh, thank you all for joining us, and uh, thank you to our speakers, and we look forward to being in touch. And I should just say we have, in two weeks, uh, we have another careers session about working on animal use committees. There's a lot of jobs for staff working on animal use committees in universities, and we have two people who are the head of the animal use committees at here at NYU speaking. It's just for the, uh, our folks, but we hope you can join us. Next week, we also have a smaller session about um, how to use resources at the library. Uh, so if you're interested, there will be pizza. Yes. <laughs> and I encourage, yes. Sorry, we use uh, Amanda from the library for the thesis workshop where she's helping people get into their thesis. But this would be, of course, with an eye toward midterms, final papers, and the like. Yeah, it's a great opportunity because we you think you know how search engines work, but you're here with access to really one of the great libraries in the world ever. Uh, and uh, it's really amazing what they have. And the more you know how to use it, the better off you will be. Okay, thank you. And uh, we'll be in touch.